So welcome. This is um, the last round of concurrent sessions for um, the seventh UMD Symposium on Environmental Justice and Health Disparities. Uh, my name is Joe Galarag. I'm a faculty assistant at the Center for Community Engagement, in Environmental Justice and Health. Uh, I assist Dr. Wilson with a number of his projects. Um, I'm interested in doing community engaged research, uh, interested in the environment, environmental justice, environmental health. And that's why I'm here today moderating this session. Um, today, we're talking about um, coastal communities and climate inequity. Um, and I'm excited to hear from um, the panelists that we have here today. So um, to get started, maybe we can go around and everybody do a bit of an introduction. Um, talk about your background. I know that maybe if you got here early, you got a little sneak peek of that as everybody on the panel was introducing themselves. But maybe we can go a little bit more in depth here and uh, explain, you know, also what brought you to this work um, beyond just the experience that you have. So um, let's start with you, Dean. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for attending. And thanks to Dr. Wilson and other organizers for inviting me to the panel. I'm excited to be here. I, I'm a, currently an assistant professor at the University of South Carolina. I'm in the Department of Geography in the School of Earth, Ocean, and Environment. And I actually find it pretty hard at times to explain what I do. I'm a geographer, without doubt, but with a background, uh, undergrad and master's in ecological sciences. Yet what I do on a day-to-day -day basis for research is increasingly community activism, or at least that's my aspiration in a lot of ways. I'm coming more and more to define my research on climate justice as abolition ecology, building on traditions in political ecology and environmental justice fields. So more specifically, while I think broadly about sea level rise, flood risk, and property law in the context of critical ecologies and critical race theory, uh, most of my work is with a community of residents and descendants of Hog Hammock on Saplo Island which is located off the coast of Georgia. Most of that community is still black, often identifying as saltwater Geechee or part of the greater Gullah Geechee cultural group, which many of you may have heard of. However, land dispossession issues are driving significant and increasingly worrying gentrification trends as is a slow but steady increase in the number and degree of flooding events. And so a lot of my work is at the intersection of those. I work with state partners like the state DNR and the Sapo Island National Estuarine Research Reserve funded by NOAA, but more importantly, I work closely with folks on the island to build strategies that preserve Geechee culture and black life in this space. And specifically working with key leaders from SICARS or the Sapo Island Cultural and Revitalization Society and SOLO or Save Our Legacy Ourself. These are two organizations that work together on cultural preservation for Hog Hammock but SICARS tackles issues uh, such as land retention uh, where Solo is more focused on agricultural revival projects. And so I work really closely with those two on those issues. You can learn more about these organizations at SICARS.org and SaveOurLegacyOurself.org. And I share this partially to promote these two Geechee run nonprofits, but also because in my collaborations with folks, I've kind of inadvertently become the web admin for both organizations. Well, thank you, Dean. Appreciate that. And I appreciate you sharing information about those organizations. Sound like they're doing really, really good work. So next we'll go to Andrea. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, and thanks for having me on the panel. Um, my name is Andrea Mirayas Barbosa. Um, I have a BS in environmental science and policy and, and an MS in marine estuarine environmental science. It's a mouthful um, from the University of Maryland. And I mostly focus on what is generally human dimensions and sort of qualitative approaches to coastal climate adaptation. Um, my thesis research focused on understanding managed retreat um, on the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland, an area that's already sort of seeing a lot of unmanaged retreat um, with sort of rural and older demographics. Um, I've worked in academic, government, and sort of nonprofit positions, and, and all these positions have sort of focused on that intersection of people living with water. Um, but outside of sort of the professional and the academic, um, because my personal experiences have definitely brought me here today, uh, I'm a Venezuelan American. Um, my parents are from Maracaibo and Caracas. Um, I've lived in Venezuela, Massachusetts, uh, Florida, and Maryland, which are all you know places where water really does affect people a lot. Um, and I mostly grew up in a place called Drow, which is a big hub of sort of Latin American immigrants. And I grew up around a lot of folks who 
went through different forms of what I would call involuntary displacement for reasons ranging from sort of scarcity of resources to literally safety and, and sort of political concerns. Um, so I grew up around displacement and I grew up around a lot of water and that sort of really shaped me and, and brought me here today. Um, and I think that also showed me how climate change and water can definitely put pressure on these existing systems of inequity that exist everywhere and how they can really shed light on those. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion with you all. Thank you, Andrea, I appreciate it. Um, let's talk with, uh, yeah, Elizabeth, can you uh, give a brief intro? Sure, um, I'll echo what Andrea and uh, Dean both said and, and thank, thank you all for having me a part of this panel. Um, I am, uh, um, I am a, a project manager with the Nature Conservancy, and in that capacity, I support um, the Maryland DC chapter of TNC in um, uh, community engagement work and, and integrating um, um, equitable nature-based solutions uh, in supporting adaptation on the, the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, I have a PhD in environmental anthropology from the University of Maryland, as well as a, a master's in applied anthropology there. And um, that work really got me into this um, space working on um, rural environmental justice, climate justice issues, which is uh, really what I, I'm interested in and helping to support. Um, a lot of my um, experience as an anthropologist has been working with these rural underserved disenfranchised communities on the Lower Eastern Shore. Um, that are um, really on the front lines for these climate impacts. And they don't have a lot of capacity or agency in this space to shape what adaptation looks like in, um, in the sort of regional decision-making process. And so I'm really um, interested in helping to elevate that, those voices in these conversations and, and make sure that those communities that are um, in most dire need of adaptation support are um, able to get that, that support moving forward. Um, uh, prior to uh, working for the Nature Conservancy, I was a postdoc at the University of Maryland where I um, helped coordinate a collaborative partnership called the Deal Island Peninsula Partnership, um, which was uh, an experiment in, in using collaborative learning and collaborative decision-making to improve um, resource channels and um, decision-making um, support for these rural underserved communities. So it's a, an experiment in how do we increase agency for these, for these populations and, and give them space at these decision-making tables so that they can help to shape what adaptation looks like. Um, and I'll just add lastly that um, like Andrea, um, I'm, I'm really interested in bringing attention to the importance of the human dimensions of, of coastal resilience challenges and um, thinking through how do we create more space in these conversations for those considerations, which I think is critical for our work in building um, more equitable and just um, climate change work. Um, and I'll stop there. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate you being here. And um, last but not least, let's talk with uh, Bob. So oh, thank you. I'm Bob Musil. I'm the president and CEO of the Rachel Carson Council which is an environmental organization that Rachel Carson wanted founded as she was dying of breast cancer while writing Silent Spring. I was not there at the time, uh, but I come to all of this work with a very long, long history, as you can see, going back to Vietnam and civil rights days uh, where those issues became linked for me and led through a long period of work in anti-nuclear work, anti-war. That of course led to the environment, which is completely connected to these things, which then put them into an intersectional justice context. Uh, so I have, I write books on the subject. I speak uh, on these things. And the Rachel Carson Council, importantly, I think has about 57 campuses and a network of five to 10,000 active faculty okay. students. <laughs> And then on high, on, on high, whatever. I'm getting somebody is joining us. Audio sounded almost like Shacoby, but I could be wrong. Uh, in any case, the Rachel Carson Council has a campus network. Uh, we also have a fellowship program. We currently have a dozen fellows working at campuses on environmental justice projects. Uh, and we both advocate, read, lobby in Washington and in state capitals and 
do grassroots organizing and education on campuses and communities. Related to this subject in particular, I first met uh, Dr. Wilson Jacoby through an old friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Steve Wing, who was a mentor to Jacoby, I would say. And Steve and I uh, had worked on anti-nuclear things before any, well, long ago. And then when I took over the Rachel Carson Council, I began work in North Carolina with Steve uh, on CAFOs and the problems of predominantly African-American communities living around there and the health issues, the pollution issues, and of course, climate change issues. I would urge people to take a look at some of the reports we've done related to environmental justice and coastal issues that include pork and pollution, which has to do with those CAFOs in Eastern North Carolina. Another one, Foul Matters, is about chicken CAFOs and pollution and justice in Maryland, where Shikobi and I have done a lot of work uh, together on problems there. Another one called Blast Zone, which traces uh, the opposition and the problems connected to natural gas pipelines and infrastructure and how it just mysteriously always goes through areas where no one lives. Except poor people, people of color, indigenous people, um, they somehow have a magic wand that finds those areas. Um, and most recently we've been focusing uh, in North Carolina in this case, but around the country on air cutting and the production of wood pellets or biomass, which is counted and claimed as renewable and carbon neutral in some circles, but is not. And again, if you look where we do a lot of grassroots organizing in North Carolina, Maryland, Pennsylvania, areas where Rachel Carson had deep concerns elsewhere, but we focus a lot. And in North Carolina, um, they're just, all of the problems that I've ticked off happen near the coast, along the coast, or in essentially seven or eight counties that have overlapping issues that are related to climate, which include gas infrastructure, CAFOs, flooding, um, air pollution. And as you all know, that's called environmental racism. We work on it until we consider environmental justice. And that's why I'm here and have been doing this a long time. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, thanks to everybody for their introductions. Um, and I think that really want to just kind of dig into some of the basics that we're going to talk about with regards to climate justice and um, climate inequities. So climate change affects everybody. But, you know, as we're talking about uh, throughout this whole symposium, there are people who are disproportionately impacted. Um, and because of this, we have to say that climate change is an environmental justice issue and why we're highlighting it here today during this session. Um, and particularly, I think that there's considerations for coastal communities. Um, and so, Andrea, I want to start with you and in, in, in talking about some of the ways that you have seen through the work that you do or at various experiences. Um, how are coastal communities disproportionately impacted by climate change? Um, thanks. Sure, Joe. Thanks. Um, I think climate change disproportionately impacts coastal communities in, in two big ways. So, so the first one is I think the one that we're usually more familiar with and, and the one that we talk about a lot is just increased exposure to natural hazards from climate change. Um, and that's especially important to discuss in this context of coasts because communities of color, especially black and indigenous communities have been targeted by practices like forced migration and, and redlining and slavery that have intentionally situated these folks into areas that have that were historically and are very much undesirable on the floodplain, right? Um, so they're not beachfront properties um, with a nice view, right? They're somewhat usually inland and they're low lying and they're really exposed to water. So there's just this legacy of situating communities in areas that like share the disproportionate front of climate change impacts. Um, and, and I think I always think back to like predominantly black communities outside of the levee system in New Orleans when Katrina hit in 2005. Um, and then this big sort of second way that climate change disproportionately impacts um, coastal communities is in actual adaptation and ability to respond, right? Um, a researcher named Elizabeth Marino, who's an anthropologist, um, she coined a term that I think is really important to this discussion, which is adaptation privilege. Um, and it refers basically to specific communities' ability to respond to climate change better because of their increased access to resources and governance. 
and, and it's really well documented in the literature, right? You have two areas that are sort of this ex, uh, sharing the same physical exposure to natural hazards. It's the more socially vulnerable community that um, won't be able to adapt in a preferred way. So you have sort of wealthier and whiter areas adapting in ways that are preferred, like it, uh, elevating homes or, or building seawalls, things that keep them sort of in place, while poor communities and communities of color tend to have to leave home, right, which is definitely not preferable. Um, so I don't think climate change itself is acting unjustly. I think what's determining sort of the, the distribution of unjust impacts is a system that's been set up to protect some communities from climate change at the expense of others. Thank you, Andrea. I, yeah, I think that that's important to note is that this is systemic, right? This is not, um, when we talk about disproportionate impacts, I, I just previously was doing a discussion on how, you know, the coincidence of, of lead and, and redlining within cities, you see that this is, you know, this is a design, this is the result of policy. Um, Elizabeth, do you have anything you want to add here? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I um, agreed with everything, Andrea, that you shared. Um, I, when in thinking about how to answer this question, I was thinking about it largely in terms of these highly rural, underserved communities. And you know, Andrea, you mentioned that these are these are aging um, communities. It certainly is a, a disadvantage. They're losing a lot of um, their youth who are, are moving to places where there's better economic opportunity. And and with that, they're losing a, a huge part of their their human capital that is important for figuring out how to deal with these impacts. Um, their economies tend to be in decline, and that's in part due to the fact that we've, we're seeing these broader socio-political shifts that are um, shifting, um, you know, farming. And uh, in, in the Chesapeake Bay region, we have a lot of watermen, commercial fishermen, and they're struggling in, in terms of having to compete with these, with these international markets. But also the land and water that they are working are um, being directly impacted by these changes. And so Farmers are losing productive land. Watermen are, are struggling to um, catch, um, meet the catch needs that they need to put food on their tables. And so um, this is putting another additional stress on these communities. Um, but these rural, highly underserved rural communities are also very much politically um, disadvantaged in terms of both their physical uh, proximity to decision-making tables, but then you add um, these social dimensions of race and ethnicity that disproportionately impact, um, for example, African American communities that live in these low lying places that are really on the front lines and, and they are silenced in these discussions about how to access um, money and how to get support for dealing with flooding that's directly affecting them right now. Um, uh, and then on top of that, the, the sort of governance structures of these rural communities, they are, um, you know, county government is the, the, the place where a lot of these decisions are being made and these county governments are having to compete with more wealthy, more resourced, um, more well-staffed urban municipalities and, and counties that can better access that adaptation funding. And so they're, they're really struggling to, to, meet, to meet the demands of their communities. Um, and the last point I wanted to make is that um, while these rural underserved communities um, are struggling economically. They're incredibly rich in these natural resources. And these natural resources, the lands um, that are adjacent to these, like marshes, for example, are um, increasingly of, of, of interest to environmental groups who want to protect these things, these lands for um, future wildlife, future um, habitat, and that's all well and good, but the problem is, is that these conversations are largely ignoring the fact that these rural landscapes are incredibly rich and important human landscapes as well. And so the human element in these conversations gets ignored. And I think that um, further disenfranchises these particular communities in these conversations about how we um, help these landscapes adapt to change. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, adding a new layer of injustice to this climate change conversation. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective. You know, lack of um, various infrastructure, disinvestment, and then also uh, ignoring the fact that uh, it's almost dehumanizing when, when it, in this way of, of understanding these areas and not um, uh, understanding that the people how, how people have lived on the land, how people have occupied the land. So I appreciate that very much. Um, Bob, do you have anything else that you want to add here? Yes. Um, 
I hadn't heard the term um, adaptation privilege. Is that right, Andrea? Um, but we see it and work with it all the time. I, I think it's important for people to understand that the response of the federal government to disasters caused by the flooding and sea level rise and hurricanes and so on is already disproportionate. That it is very difficult uh, to access and it's biased in many ways for people of color, poor people, et cetera. The insurance rates are similarly uh, disproportionate or very difficult to get so that the rich get richer. And, and I'm well aware because we organize around both the comfortable and the uncomfortable, if you will. And I'll just use North Carolina as our handy example. Uh, you know, if you, um, I have staff people whose parents live on Baldhead Island. It's a very nice place. Uh, we grew up, she's an environmentalist because it's a secluded, nice houses, privileged kind of place. And they had difficulties, but they were able to rebuild, the houses are on stilts, all those kinds of things we were talking about and not far away, things are blown down, not rebuilt, et cetera. There's just a, a tremendous difference between them. I want to say a quick word about other people. I, mean, I could go on about how on the shores, and I think you alluded to this, that, you know, the comfortable, you know, I have friends in both parts of the spectrum, say in Charleston, where the flooding there is, to, is ruining all sorts of neighborhoods, hurricanes have had disproportionate damage. My friends who've retreated from the flooding are leaving a second home in Charleston uh, and getting another one. You know, it's sad. They can't live in Charleston anymore, but it's very, very, very different. But it's the people who work. I, I just want to say a couple of words. We've been reacting throughout this heat waves going on that climate change is not just sea level rise and flooding, it's also air pollution, heat, and workers of all kinds, particularly outdoor workers. There are no federal standards. I didn't know this. I don't work outside. You see where I work, an air conditioned place with a computer. The folks who work outside are suffering from severe heat stroke, heat exposure, sometimes death. Um, similarly, people, when I, I mentioned CAFOs, we began worrying about the residents, African-Americans mostly, and often they had their land taken or they were stuck there. Uh, but of course, there are people who work inside the CAFOs, whether it's hogs or chickens. The conditions are unbelievable, the temperatures of things raised, exacerbated by the heat that we're going through. So I wanted to put in a word as we think about responses or policy or how we're gonna make change, we have to make sure I think that workers outdoors, indoors, uh, particularly in places that are unventilated, heated, et cetera, are at tremendous risk from what we're talking about. It's another form of climate injustice. Uh, that we have to include in the broad kinds of policy and other kinds of responses to try to help you. Thank you for that. Yes, um, this is something that I've heard in other sessions too, is, um, is, is uh, I, I previously moderated a session on food sovereignty and we're talking about how do you have a just food system, but who, who are the people that are involved in the production of, of your of the food and who are really not receiving much of the benefits, right? Uh, maybe you get a, a very meager wage, but otherwise the profits are being taken elsewhere um, and not being reinvested in the community. So thank you for that. Um, and Dean, we can uh, uh, end this one with you. I believe you're muted. Year and a half, still making mistakes. Um, so thanks, Joe, and uh, thanks to Andrea for bringing up the uh, adaptation privilege. Elizabeth Marino's work is really inspirational. Um, and also, Joe, when you were mentioning, you know, feeding off of what we had already said, these ideas of system levels, I'm going to kind of take a step back here a little bit from the details of my work on SAPLO and think about broader um, ideas around sea level rise and environmental justice. And, I want to caveat this by saying that all ideas are, you know, build on others' ideas, and sometimes it's easy to overlook people. But I want to highlight a few folks that um, really helped me think through some of these issues around sea level rise related to my 
more recent work that I've been doing on Zaplo, um, particularly some close friends of mine who are, have written some stuff bridging critical race studies and political ecology. But in particular, three amazing geographers, Laura Polito, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Catherine McKittrick's work, all three of whom have made the point in various ways in more recent publications that, that while environmental justice ideas of assessing disproportionate harms are necessary and important, right, no, no doubt, it's also important to work on dismantling the conditions and systems that produce those disproportionate outcomes. Mm -hmm. And Polito talks about these ideas as racialized outcomes of disproportionate harms, kind of versus thinking about it as racialized production of differential value under our current political economic framework of racial capitalism. So I'd like to say clearly that through my work on SAPLO and working with SAPLO residents, I've realized that sea level rise is environmental racism. Even if not in its measurable outcomes of dif differential flood risk impacts on populations, it is environmental racism in its production of differential value across racialized class and gender differences. So in other words, coastal communities of color have not benefited nearly as much as white coastal communities from the processes, the processes of carbon-based capitalism that have created and currently sustain rising seas. So then my, my point here really is that even if we find no measurable, quantifiable, disproportionate harms due to flood risk across social difference uh, within diverse coastal communities or even between white coastal communities and coastal communities of color, the racialized production of climate change via racial capitalism and by association, right, sea level rise associated with anthropocentric climate change is a form of environmental racism at the systemic level. And is something that I think we as justice scholars have to consider beyond just assessing disproportionate impacts and how to mitigate those, how do we dismantle these systems of production? Yes, thank you, Dean. Thank you so much. I think that um, another theme that's been emerging through the symposium upstream, we're not, uh, you know, if, if we're treating symptoms, if we're just doing science of discovery, analyzing these things, it's not really, you're not touching the, the, the forces that are really producing. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I do want to dig in a bit to, um, you know, some of the more specific research that, that you've done your, your work and your experiences. And it's also kind of, um, you know, relates to Elizabeth's comment about, you know, ignoring the, the, the human aspects of these coastal areas and something that you brought up at the beginning. Um, there's a, you know, there are a number of communities who rely on the, the, the coast for their livelihood and also their culture. And I'm thinking of the, the Gullah Geechee um, Creole identities, which are not only tied to the ancestry uh, um, and, and, and history, but also to the land itself, right? The, the low country, coastal plains, bayou, et cetera. And I'm curious about, you know, what, how you have seen this, um, how are these changing landscapes affecting the cultures that really arose from these areas and, and, and um, have grown, you know, symbiotically? Yeah, thanks, Joe. I, I, think, I think this might've been the toughest question uh, for the panel for me to answer. Um, largely because of the politics of representation and really my positionality as a white male academic working in a predominantly black community. Um, one that is you know, self-identified as saltwater Geechee. But I'll, I'll share my take on this, knowing that maybe some listening will know that I can't speak for Geechee identity, um, but asking others to listen with this idea of my positionality in mind, right? That I, there is a politics of representation in trying to answer this question. Um, Really something that is important for folks to know who are unfamiliar, Gullah Geechee identity is so intimately tied to coastal environments that the ancestors of current descendants were specifically sought by plantation owners at the time for their expertise of farming and tidal environments, right? That was to grow rice and whatnot. And historian Judith Carney reveals these connections with Western African coastal regions in her book around 2001, I think is when it came out, Black Rice, the African Origins of Rice, cultivation in the Americas. Now, a, a Saplo descendant and professor of history at Rutgers, uh, Melissa Cooper, has kind of complicated these identities of Gullah Geechee in her recent book, Making Gullah a History of Saplo Islanders Race in the American Imagination, in which Cooper argues that these identities were projected onto Black coastal, mainly rural residents of the U.S. Southeast during the early 20th century as part of 
anthropological projects um, in the hunt for African survivals in these relatively isolated black communities. Some might even like have read some of the literature on marinage or maroon communities right during enslaved time or slavery times, these communities would migrate to swamplands and whatnot. And so there's this kind of romanticization of black life in rural southeastern coastal regions that Melissa Cooper tries to tackle. Specifically though, on, on Sapelo, the um, Sapelo Island matriarch, uh, Cornelia Walker Bailey, who passed away in 2017, has claimed the identity of Saltwater Geechee specifically in her book, God, Dr. Buzzard and the Bolito Man. Uh, Saltwater Geechee talks about life on Sapelo Island, Georgia. It's a really great book to read if you're interested in, in really just fascinating stories really, but also learning more about the cultural perspective from someone within this culture. Now, importantly, Cornelia in both her book and personal conversations that we had made it clear to me that she identified as saltwater Geechee, not freshwater Geechee, like those folks who lived on the hill across the six miles of marsh, right up on the mainland, on the, you know, the continent, right? Um, and I can't claim to know the future and I'm increasingly wary of narratives of black death and loss. But what is evident is that climate change in coastal areas like Saplo and the Eastern shore of Maryland and, and beyond, right? will be intimately entangled with any changes to cultural identity as, as I, an identif identity like Saltwater Geechee um, conveys, I think. Well, thank you, Dean. I appreciate um, you, know, you, you sharing um, and also your, you know, your disclaimer as well. And I hope maybe I can follow this question up with, um, you know, I, because I know that you have been in, in, those, in those areas and, and perhaps any sorts of resources that people can access so we can hear people speak with their own voices about these issues. I don't know, I don't mean to put you on the spot if you know of any sort of documentary, accessible media or anything like that. And you know, hopefully going forward, and if we follow up with these topics, it would be it would be wonderful to have somebody come and speak um, to these issues who 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 um, who is intimately involved with them and who can pro provide that perspective actually. So I'm just if you if you want I want to um, you know give any sort of shout outs here that would be appreciated. Um, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the one name that comes to mind of someone who is identified uh, with this cultural group is, is Queen Quet or Marquetta Woodland. And she's written books um, that aren't related to climate change, but for more than a decade, maybe 15, 20 years, she's been talking about a lot of the stuff I was just saying, right? That sea level rise is a systemic racism issue. Um, so, you know, she's. Uh, the, the chiefness of the, of the Gullah Geechee Nation, which was you know, a UN recognized group at one time, and I, I believe still is, um, and it's really proactively working on this issue in the South Carolina area, really around Charleston and the St. Helena Island region, or, or yeah, on that island, and works with Climate Central a lot and has a couple of different um, committees that uh, she works with to derive scientific input and utilize that knowledge. And, they produce some pretty cool products lately, actually. Um, I could try to share those in the chat. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, excellent. So I'm going to um, head to the next question um, and talk about um, climate justice and equity um, as movements that I see are, you know, parallel to environmental justice, integral to environmental justice, but are yet somewhat different uh, in, in the specificity because the threats posed uh, by climate justice uh, or climate change, I should, should say, are unique challenges due to the scope and the progression of the issue. The fact that this is uh, you know, something that has been put into motion, it's, it's happening. Um, and unfortunately, climate change is a phenomenon that now must be weathered. And I know that Andre, you're talking about adaptation and adaptation privilege. Um, so I'm curious, are, what are some adaptations that you see as being useful to coastal communities and perhaps examples or models that you've seen um, that really work within communities maybe that don't have that sort of adaptation privilege? Um, and I would like to uh, start with Elizabeth on this question. Yeah, I, um, I, I was also hoping that I could add to a bit of what Dean just shared because I really appreciate it. Please um, do. Uh, I, uh, I forgot to mention earlier on that my, um, my research prior to joining TNC was really 
um, focused on cultural heritage and, and what cultural heritage means, how it gets utilized in conversations around change. And particularly, I was interested in how it gets mobilized in the context of climate change. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that that's a really important piece that um, we need to keep in mind as we're thinking about what gets lost with these landscape changes and this, you know, critical part of what grounds people's identity, but also serves as a critical um, asset in adaptation. You know, if you, you don't have those cultural guideposts anymore to help you make decisions or help your community figure out how you all should um, adjust to these changes, then, then that's, that's a huge loss. Um, and, and heritage is a, is a, it's a tool of power. It's a way to st stake your claim to a narrative and use that to leverage yourself. And so if you, if you lose that connection to the land and that, that ability to, to harness that tool as a, as, as power, then, then you really have, um, kind of lo lost your spot in this conversation about how, how we move forward as a, um, as a society or, you know, how you benefit in, in that, in that, in that work. Um, so I think, I think that I, I just wanted to raise that point and, and sort of put it in conversation with what Dean shared, which I, I really appreciated what you shared as a, a low country native actually, and um, uh, having some personal experience uh, with the Sea Island communities in the Carolinas and Georgia. Um, and it's, I'm sorry, Joe, could you re repeat the question once more that you wanted the rest of us to respond to? No problem, yes. Um, sorry for skipping you on that response. I'm, I'm aware of the time and trying to trying to be a good moderator here. But um, the, the question that I'm asking is, you know, in light of what the discussions that we had about, um, uh, you know, adaptation privilege. So how have you seen climate adaptations or what sorts of climate adaptations do you see as being um, useful to um, coastal communities and particularly perhaps, you know, frontline, fence line, EJ communities um, who maybe don't have the, the means or resources um, and, and maybe models that you've witnessed or, or implementations that you've witnessed that have, um, have, have been um, hopeful for you? Yeah, um, the way that I, uh, I like to think about this is, I, you know, so much of the conversation has been focused on these physical vulnerabilities, which of course we need to address, but I think a big part of what limits people's adaptive capacity in these frontline communities is their empowerment. Um, you know, they've, they've been largely disempowered by these um, systemic uh, issues that we're talking about in this entire conference. And so I think a big part of you know, thinking through what adaptation strategies we need to bring to, to the table is really creating um, strategies that, that enable people from these communities to lead that conversation and not have those decisions made by outsiders who don't look like them, who haven't lived their experience. Um, and so, uh, you know, in, in, in the work that I've been a part of, um, one of those tools has been um, uh, collaborative learning and using that as a way to build rapport, build relationships, build trust between um, a range of people who bring different experiences, knowledge, resources, and util utilizing those networks that form through that process to leverage these communities who have been left out. Um, and so I think that's a really, that's been a valuable um, adaptation strategy in our work. We're struggling with figuring out how you you keep that going um, when so much of what drives adaptation work is carried out on a project by project basis. You know, how do you sustain these kinds of important networks that are critical to um, elevating people's adaptive capacity? So um, uh, maybe I'll stop there. And I think I've probably used my two minutes and let Andrea and, and Bob uh, share their thoughts as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, appreciate it. Uh, Bob, would you be able to um, follow up here? Well, I've still been thinking about, terrible to put it this way, Dean's comment uh, about the need for systems change. Uh, and I, if you could repeat the specific question, I think I can link those things together and not take more than two minutes. No problem. So. Um, in light of uh, conversations that we've had about adaptation privilege, 
Um, how can we, uh, or what are some climate adaptations that you see as being useful um, to coastal communities, particularly well, the EJ communities? I mean, I guess uh, that's why I'm trying to link things together because in our work at the Rachel Carson Council, and I urge people to go to rachelcarsoncouncil.org, sign up, you can get our newsletters, you can get action alerts, you can take action both at local grassroots level and connecting up to national and state policy, which I believe is absolutely essential to everything that we're talking about. And so as an adaptation policy, I think it's critical for frontline communities as they have to form organizations, coalitions to develop power and voice. But that said, it is extremely difficult in a nation, as we all know, that is not only divided by zip code in terms of equality, but that the political power and the economic power are vastly skewed. And so we at the Rachel Carson Council, and I know other organizations, attempt to support partner, collaborate, work with frontline communities and their organizations. I could run through a whole line of them that uh, we have worked with. My group is small and not rich, but we try to provide funding um, because even though we're a little poorer than the nature, than the nature conservancy, that's a joke, Elizabeth, but uh, it's also true. Uh, we think it's important to introduce people to funders, to resources, to share our resources. And so not only to try to give voice and have leadership and participation from frontline communities, but speaking as a, I won't even, they don't come older, whiter, or more privileged than I am. Uh, and we could have another whole series on how in the world does a guy like me end up doing this stuff. But the fact is it is critical to try to reach out beyond our academic conferences, beyond our environmental conferences and find, I know allies is, is fraught sometimes in academic terms, but uh, so if we're gonna deal with adaptation, I'm thinking that frontline communities uh, have to look for those kinds of organizations and allies who will work and let them have a strong voice and lead, but who have some and let's admit it, some more access and power uh, to what's going on. And then you can start talking about uh, all sorts of projects that help. Currently, I'm really down on seawalls and mansions, okay? <laughs> That's like my pet peeves. So how are we gonna fix that? It's gonna take a lot of policy, a lot of work, so. Sure, thanks. And I feel like this is, uh, uh, your comments are very, um, and, and yours, Elizabeth, are very much in line with um, the donor, the Donors of Color Network um, panel that we had yesterday. That's really about, you got to, you know, put your money where your mouth is. You have to fund these organizations. You have to fund organizations that are led by frontline fence line communities, led by communities of color. Um, and that's really, you know, put your money where your mouth is. So Andrea, I wonder if you have anything else to add here? Sure. Um, I think, uh, I think building up, <laughs> almost opposite of Liz's point, but I'll come back to it. I think building up natural infrastructure actually can be a super useful tool for coastal communities, marginalized coastal communities. Um, but we can definitely be way more thoughtful about how we do it. Um, so, so a lot of times scientists and planners and engineers will get together and say, well, this is the most effective place to put in this marsh building project or, or something like that. And, and those places aren't always the places that would protect people and what they care about the most. Um, so building up natural infrastructures, right, is an incredibly useful thing to do. But coming back to Liz's point of empowerment, having coastal communities input and actual follow through on that input on, on what areas need protecting and, and what areas are the most important to those communities, I think, is a good um, tool. And then, I mean, I if there's time, I want to talk about one really quickly that I think is useful to talk about because it's really a big part of a coastal adaptation conversation, but it's really controversial, which is relocation. Um, and I don't really think that relocation right now is useful or equitable in the way that it's done, but but I think it has the potential to be a really good tool. Um, at a basic level, you know, it gets people out of harm's way, but I think for it to be good, it needs to leave people 
way better than than where they are right now. Um, so so I think that includes a lot of a community agency about whether or not to relocate and where they should relocate to and and what all that includes. And certainly the point of funding things that look like more than just a home buyout because that's a pretty inequitable process is just giving you home value for you know go go figure out where to go and we're not going to build your capacity or we're not going to help you build capacity at all um so i don't think it should be the first line of defense or the first sort of adaptation sought out by any coastal community there needs to be sort of multiple lines of defense um so you have enough time to plan a good vision of what you want your future to look like and, and a lot of agency and community agency in that process um and maybe that looks like putting in natural infrastructure now or a home out el home elevations now so that you have 20 more years to plan um but i bring this up because relocation is happening anyways and it's happening in an unmanaged way and that in and of itself exacerbates a lot of in inequities and i think a managed process done correctly has really strong transformational potential to address a lot of the issues that marginalized coastal community experience i think there's a lot to figure out with that but but I want to put it out there on the table because I think it's something that we're talking about more in coastal spaces and we're not sure how to approach it. And if we don't think of it really thoughtfully can be more problematic than helpful. Sure, I see anticipation and, and, and trying to, instead of, uh, I don't want to say um, uh, ignoring the inevitable, but um, figure out a way to, to uh, as opposed to how so many other things have happened so haphazardly um, and without thought. So appreciate, appreciate that perspective as well. Um, I want to talk about something that this is certainly um, what I've learned through discussions with some uh, people here at UMD, um, Dr. Shakobi Wilson being one of them, Dr. Marcus Hendricks, um, and that's the idea of resilience. I think that for communities, climate change is often discussed alongside the idea of being resilient. Um, you know, communities are expected to be resilient in the face of a number of challenges, such as, you know, health hazards, poverty, disinvestment, racism, et cetera. So I'm curious about what people think about this term resilience. And what can we do for com communities so that they are no longer expected to be resilient, but instead protected? Sort of hearing a little bit of that from Andrea's response previously, but um, I want to start here with uh, with you, Bob, and see what uh, what you have to, to say here. Well, you know, you had a wonderful soundbite there that you know, says that they're protected rather than resilient. Uh, that pretty much says it. Um, to get there. Um, Well, I, I'm getting back to the old political structure. Um, and let me pass on that for a moment, if you will. Sure. Uh, anybody here want to jump in, have some thoughts here? Jump in. Um, I like to think of resilience as as empowerment. It's it's a way, it's, it's how you um, decide for yourself what your path forward looks like and that you have the agency to shape that path forward. And so, you know, a lot of our conversations around coastal resilience, again, as I mentioned earlier, I think tend to focus on the physical vulnerabilities, but so much of resilience has to be about protecting those, those human um, and social assets that really support people's ability to um, to access the table, the, the, the decision-making table, to, to protect the, the core of who they are and, and navigating these changes going forward. And so um, I think, uh, you know, with climate change work, we really have to figure out how to, to um, in talking about resilience, how do we give um, marginalized, disenfranchised communities um, uh, the power to to help lead these conversations and um, the you know have the agency to to define what that adaptation looks like for them um, and uh, mechanisms to support that. Um, uh, I think that also means that you know we need to give value to other forms of knowledge that aren't typically uh, legitimized in these spaces. You know that the, the um, uh, local ecological knowledge uh, and community uh, expertise that um, really can help us understand the the the, the pieces of um, 
that social resilience that need to be protected as we're um, navigating climate change. I, you know, if I can jump back in, or, or as we say in Washington, yield back my 30 seconds. Um, I never liked the term resilience, and that's part of my problem in trying to answer your question, but I liked a lot. Uh, do you go by Liz rather than Elizabeth, am I hearing? Sorry. But, uh, is a lot of what the Rachel Carson Council, obviously based on what Rachel Carson was doing, is, is concerned about culture, and uh, you're an anthropologist, and um, that in my teaching and my organizing and educational work over, you know, is getting people to appreciate, it's not just difference, but that uh, let's take the Gullah Geechee people. Uh, well, obviously first, most Americans don't even know they exist to be blunt, even though there are a million uh, of them along the coast there. Uh, but to, to begin to understand what, cultural, intellectual, all sorts of things that they bring. I've seen this over and over again when I took students to organize against mountaintop removal. They're uncomfortable with people uh, in Appalachia who are quite uh, religious, mostly Christian. These are kids from American University in Washington who are quite secular, like, what's with all the gospel singing? Whatever they, it's always positioning these communities as the other. And unless you can begin to elevate a variety of cultural worth, uh, whether it's people in the mountains in Appalachia, along the coasts, uh, that strikes me as at the core of finding a way to value and therefore create the kind of resilience which is appreciating and understanding and giving recognition and power for those people that we have a hell of a lot to learn from it, that isn't immediately obvious. So you have to, I think, open up one's receptivity. You know, we all have been around and we study a lot, probably too much, uh, but I constantly try to imagine if I'm introducing some average person, <laughs> if there is such a thing, uh, to some of these, what seem to them different, exotic, you know, uh, they're not going to do anything and nothing will happen much unless we can make it tangible, real. Um, and that's where I think, so we do lots of art projects, music projects, psychology, you know, there's all sorts of these soft things, the humanities that Rachel was involved in as well as science that I think are, are critical. I just wanted to say last footnote, my daughter studied with Judy Carney out of UCLA and uh, this marvelous, marvelous work. Okay, um, Dean, do you have anything uh, to add here? Let me uh, just try to make it brief. Um, I appreciate Liz's perspective here. And I, I think, however, though, I wanna push back on it just a little bit. I, I, there are ways to still use the term resilience, but I, I, I think it's a problematic term in most instances. And that's because typical academic and policy-minded narratives of overcoming flood risk, right? Including improving, include improving coastal community resilience, right? And this often implies the ability to thinking about it from a systems level to maintain or return to a stable state after a flood, for example. And it, a lot of folks have started to push against that and think more through this justice lens, which gets us to kind of systems level thinking, where resilience in a way tries to build back the institutions that's there. And that's not the way everyone thinks about it. Uh, the definition that Liz provided was not really there, but I think a lot of times it's invoked in that way or internalized by funders and people on the ground. And what I would argue then is that resilience discourse too often forecloses on imagining alternative futures and implicitly invokes this return to what I was talking about earlier, these kind of logics of racial capitalism where, you know, the way the labor and value are derived from society are not only contended contingent upon a racialized difference uh, for capitalism to continue to grow, but they're actually like the structural foundation that undergirds capitalism's uh, persistent kind of racial violence in these spaces. And this is a little bit jargony I recognize, but to, so to protect frontline communities, like the one I work with on Alcamic, like those on the Eastern shore, indigenous communities, you know, um, 
up in the New York City area and other places in Alaska that, that I've had the privilege of working peripherally with, at least through scholars who work with them. Um, from being disposed, dispossessed of their lands and cultures really goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It requires this kind of radical system level transformation um, that fosters self-determination within those communities, which I think is what everyone was talking about in the previous question. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I, I see this once again. I'm, I'm, I've been, I've been going through all these various sessions of the symposium, so I'm, I'm, I'm picking out a lot of themes for myself, and, yeah. and I appreciate um, this perspective. Um, Andrea, I wanted to see if you had anything else you wanted to put in here. Sure, I think, um, sort of bridging. I, I agree with Liz and Dean. Um, I think resilience is a, a tough word, and I, and I always think back to that idea that we define it a lot as coming back to some sort of balance or, or point of stasis, but with climate change, it's sort of creeping and compounding, like how do, how do we define stasis, right? And I think when we're thinking about how to make communities protected as opposed to having to constantly be resilient in the face of repetitive sort of impacts, I think we who occupy environmental spaces and do this work, we need to, I guess what, what Dean was getting at is focus less on making the system bounce back or come back into some sort of balance and focus on sort of a transformational system where, where we acknowledge that there's historic and current practices that have forced people to become resilient. Um, and figuring out ways to create pathways to protection as opposed to having to continuously be resilient. And I think especially because when you think about us coming back to a system that's never actually served marginalized communities that well, like there's never a balance for those communities, we need to rethink resilience from bouncing back to, to transforming systems that work for the greater good and not just the ones who are sort of benefiting at the expense of others. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna to come to, uh, we have one more question. Hopefully we'll have some time for Q and A afterward as well. And I kind of think, you know, these questions were prepared ahead of time. And I think that based on what I'm hearing, um, you know, I feel I'm, I kind of am going to maybe modify this slightly and I want to kind of, uh, you know, something you just said, Andrea, pathways to protection. How do we get to those pathways of protection? Um, how do we create those actual pathways to protection? I know I was previously going to ask about um, policies, but, you know, what I'm hearing from Dean, what I'm hearing just generally from this conversation also is that, you know, uh, a lot of the, the, the policies are perhaps maybe some of this, this stasis that we're talking about and, and maybe there's some, there's some room for, or not even room, necessity for some um, reimagining some alternative um, reality here, um, alternative narrative. Um, so I guess, Liz, if we could start with you. I'm curious about, you know, imagining these pathways um, or, or if there is any sort of policy mechanism that we could use here. Um, to create these um, and, and, and how you think we might get there? Um, yeah, the, the, that's a tough question. Um, I, I think that, you know, there needs to be some, some policy shifts to enable, to, 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 to promote that transformation. We need to have people from these communities part of the conversation and I think Traditionally, the way that uh, we tend to approach um, resilience and carry out resilience as projects is, you know, we develop a project and then we take it to a, a place that might have a community and we, you know, the project is always brought in after the fact. And so we need to really encourage that dialogue to happen well before projects are designed or even, um, come to mind and, and work closely with communities to develop those ideas in ways that can lead to those transformations. Um, I think that uh, we also need to um, have mechanisms to support more um, community leadership programming as part of this. Um, I think about, you know, I, again, I, I talked about the Deal Island Peninsula Partnership and part of that is, you know, the interest in that project is figuring out how to leverage these underserved communities so that they can have a seat at the table, but we don't have a mechanism to sustain that. So how can we 
you know, support those kinds of initiatives. And I think there are better examples out there. I'll, I'll, I think, um, for example, Lead the Coast down in, in Louisiana has done a phenomenal job at creating a, a program to um, elevate um, community leaders from these frontline communities. Um, and they, it's run by a foundation that has the mechanisms to sustain this process, this engagement to continue providing that support over the long run. And then, so I think um, we need more policies or mechanisms to, to support that kind of long-term investment that allows for that accountability in these places that need it the most. And when you make those investments, I think that you create the space for those kinds of transformations to, to happen because you're allowing new voices to shape what that looks like that maybe haven't been part of these conversations to date, at least in a meaningful way. Thank you. Bob, any follow up here? Yeah. I have, even though I'm a supposed progressive wild environmental guy, I don't like to be too controversial. I uh, continue to think that we need to link up to political entities be blunt. Part of the reason I chair two political action committees, part of the reason I work both on Capitol Hill and in state capitals, as well as in communities, is that um, to get the kind of change that is needed around climate and climate justice and the policies to fix resilience, adaptation, sea level rise, my experience, I'm sorry to say, is that too often people shy away from politics. Uh, you can call it policy, you can call it advocacy, but I was struck uh, as I was looking at a number of things that Queen Quet had, had, read, had written before I came on the air with all of you. Um, and she talked, for example, about uh, her interest in South Carolina and the U.S. 30 by 30 plans to conserve 30% of waterways and 30% of the year by the, land, uh, by the year 2030. That means that you know, we can talk about the culture, we could do all these sort of things, but that she uses her position as a leader in this community to link up to policies that are at play where you have to have access to representation. And that's where I would say, just for example, on climate, I've been doing it more than you wanna know. I was quite happy to see I'm on the old end, so I work more with Ed Markey than with AOC. But the truth is when we're developing the Green New Deal, yes, a lot of it comes up from the grassroots, from organizers and the rest. A lot of it is developed by people who've been doing this a long time, but it is only when there is something that is introduced as a serious political, and even then it's a little bit on the margins, gotta push. So I, and I know it's also difficult in academia. I mean, you're not supposed to generally, I guess, say, you know, I think uh, Biden's better than Trump. He's not what I wanted, but it's going okay. Those kinds of conversations get marginalized, if I may. And so I hope that out of the conference, which is doing a fabulous job about identifying, lifting up, naming environmental injustices, climate justice issues, the role of communities, of projects and programs that we all can begin to link up to entities, both in state capitals, Washington, and, and frankly, national organizations who come a long way. We all know the history of environmental racism in mainstream organizations they, believe it or not, have changed a lot. Um, and so I would, that's, that's what I would say. Um, that's part of why I do what I do rather than just teach all the time. Thank you, Bob, appreciate that. Um, Andrea? Um, I'm not sure this is a policy per se, but, but it's def definitely something that contributes to like policy formulation. Um, and I think goes into a lot of adaptation work is just the cost benefit analysis model. It's really standard to almost everything that adaptation works around, um, trying to figure out which adaptations make the most sense. Um, usually they're economic evaluations and you know federal agencies like FEMA use them. 
and they assign values to communities based on physical exposure to things or property loss and, and value. And I think they really don't do the best or, or I don't, don't even really attempt to capture social and cultural losses. Um, and so we have a tool that's sort of made to determine which projects, adaptation projects, we should basically be putting our money towards that don't properly account for the comprehensive set of losses that coastal communities experience, especially marginalized coastal communities. Um, and in lots of cases, they exacerbate issues of inequity by not addressing how lower property values are usually tied to problematic and racist policies. Um, so, so I don't think I'm the economic brain that knows how to restructure that evaluation tool, but I think that specific policy change could go a long way in figuring out how to capture some of those more intangibles, social values into these um, evaluations and, and how to properly protect people based on the actual losses experienced. Thank you, Andrea uh, and Dean. Hey, thanks, Joan. Yeah, I was just saying that, um, I think two things. I think first, kind of as a first measure stopgap would be to create a federal governmental agency with direct funding lines that underserved coastal communities could apply to. And I'm talking about an agency on par with NSF and FEMA. Why can I apply for $18 million through the Coastlands and People NSF program? But it's difficult for that kind of money without it coming through a university institution to get to nonprofits and other organizations that are the representatives we're talking about, not those of us at Rachel Carson or TNC, not to knock the work we do, but there needs to be a more direct line if we're gonna talk about self-determination and empowerment of coastal communities. Um, second though, really, and this gets back to some of the stuff we've all been talking about, you know, really what we need are policies at the federal level that abolish the systems that produce these disproportionate impacts in the first place. You know, mass incarceration, unequal pay, housing discrimination, even certain property laws. Um, facilitate this kind of disproportionate burden in particular communities. And in this case, we're talking about underserved coastal communities. And if we create policies that are not always specifically about the thing we think we're trying to address through climate change adaptation, but facilitate a more egalitarian society, then it's more likely that communities that we're discussing um, would have the power to take care of these issues themselves and self-determine their own futures without our assistance. All right, thank you, Dean. Um, so I think that we're at 327. Um, I think we maybe have time for uh, one very quick question. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat. Um, I wanna thank all of you for being here today. Um, it was such a pleasure for me to moderate this session and to hear all of your various perspectives and to share the, the knowledge and um, share resources as well. Um, so I want to thank you all for your time today. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, if anybody has any questions for the panel, we've got a just a few minutes left. Um, I think pursuant also to this last question, the final session of the day um, is about the um, uh, White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, so if you <laughs> are interested in uh, attending that panel, uh, that will begin at 3.40, and uh, Kenya has put a link to that in the chat. Um, so thank you all very much for being here. Um, appreciate it. Thanks to attendees. Thank you to our panelists, and um, see you over in the WeJack room. Thank you. Thank you.